Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's stand together. We've got several needs today to bring to God. Let's bring um, Julie Garner, the Grady's, uh, the Griggs, uh, Jackie Johnson, Daryl Malier, Sister Malier, uh, Cindy Nooner's dad, and Sister Shockey. Of course, continue to remember Sister Smith as well. She plans on being here. But let's pray for um, uh, God's touch upon her. Let's, let's lift our voice and talk to God. If you have any other need, let's bring those to the Lord as well. God, thank you. We come to you with every need that we have. Today, we know that you're well able to supply every need according to your riches and glory. God, I thank you that you care for us so deeply. Every name that's been listed and named, God, I pray that you will heal their bodies, that you will strengthen them, that you'll give them speedy recoveries, God. The same blood that saves us is the same blood that heals us, God. And so we give you praise, we give you honor. And of course, our priority prayer is always that you will sweep this city with a revelation of the holiness of your name, a revelation of the oneness of your name, of the necessity, the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let that that revelation, those, those uh, insights, God, sweep the city, every neighborhood, every congregation. We'll be faithful to give you praise and honor and glory for that. In your name we pray, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Let's worship together. How many know there's power in prayer? Somewhere, somebody is praying tonight for a loved one who wandered away from the light. But faith reaches heaven and God is aware. And forever is changed in one moment of prayer. Oh, there's power in prayer. Power to spare. All that you'll ever need is waiting right there. A few words, a little child's faith. And it's goodbye, despair. Oh, there's power, so much power. There's power in prayer. An old man holds a body that's periled in pain. The doctors have tried, but hope is in vain. Oh, but wait. Someone's praying in the midst of the gloom. And all at once, the great physician steps into the room. Oh, there's power in prayer. Power to spare. All that you'll ever need is waiting right there. child's faith and it's goodbye despair oh there's power so much power there's power in prayer yes there's power in prayer power to spare all that you'll ever need is waiting right there a few birds a little child's faith and it's goodbye despair oh there's power so much power there's power in prayer if you believe that why don't you lift your hands to god right now and thank him for the power that we have in prayer that we can access we don't have faith in our prayer we don't have faith in our faith we have faith in you and when we pray, you hear and answer and respond. We thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Remember that we are in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Um, and if you've not had so, I encourage you, if you're at all able, to go on a three-day fast during this time period. God, God responds when we fast and when we pray. Uh, this Thursday is Memphis Prayer 365, and so we'll complete um, the schedule today during service. And then next Saturday will be our last community prayer 
uh, during this time of prayer and fasting. Um, we had a tremendous prayer summit yesterday. Um, our speakers were not able to stay due to the snow where they live. It's already flying. It's not supposed to fly here to four o'clock. And so it uh, made sense for them to head that way. Um, I want to continue kind of along the thought line that I had last week, um, just calling it pray. I guess this is part two. And I want to share with you something that I've shared with you before, but not nearly to the extent that I did when I was in New York. It's called the theology of prayer. It's not original with me. It's original with Michael Blankenship, a pastor in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And when I first read this study, it revolutionized my prayer. And in New York, in the early days of the church, uh, I preached this every year. They knew it wasn't mine, but I preached it every year. It became a part of the language of our church. And I believe this one concept about prayer will change prayer from a duty to a privilege. If we're not, if we're not, if we're honest, prayer becomes a duty sometimes. But when we understand this concept, um, it, it's revolutionary. So I started with James chapter five. We read this last week, verse 14 through 18. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up and... If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed. That is accountability. Uh, it's another topic for another time, but I wonder how much sickness we have because we just won't confess our faults. The reason we don't talk about that much is because none of us want to descend into a mindset that thinks if something bad happens to us, we did something wrong. But if we have faults, we should... Uh, we should confess them. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So we talked about last week really that Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are means he was a man just like us. We, we all are, are tempted to do this. My goodness, if we could get a prophet to pray, if we could, if we could get the man of God to pray, if we could get somebody that we've seen pray, God will hear their prayer more than ours. God's not that way. I mean, can you imagine if, if um, um, one of your children is, is known and makes a lot of money and is famous um, and another one isn't, do, do you respond differently? I hope not. You're their dad. You respond the same because they're your children. So it doesn't matter what gifting somebody has. God hears our prayers. How, how can this verse of Scripture um, become the reality? I believe it's the theology of prayer. It's understanding what prayer will and will not do. So let's build a foundation to work on. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Egypt, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. This was God's plan for man. He put him in paradise and said, Take care of it. God gave him a place, if you will. He leased the planet to Adam. It's God's planet, but I'm going to put you here. You take care of it. We know all this because Genesis 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb uh, bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for me. What, what a gift. 
Um, the Creator gave a portion of His creation to another part of His creation. We, we can build a building, but we can't build a planet. We, 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 don't, we can even understand uh, the molecular structure of certain things, but we can't create that. God put that in our hands, and He said, subdue it. Have, some menu, have dominion over it. I'm leasing this place to you. I still own it, but I am placing it under your control. God says that there is a major clause. When I give this to you, there's one thing I don't want you to do. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's that, it's that one thing you can't do. You know how we humans are. It's the one thing we can't have that we want. Try this. Take, take a, a preteen into a grocery store and say, look, you can have anything in the store you want, but you just can't have name whatever it is. They're going to want the one thing that they can't have. It's human nature. We want what we can't have. Chapter 3, verse number 1 of Genesis, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Thou shalt not eat of every tree of the garden. Verse number 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave it also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. The devil always twists and distorts the truth. God said, if you eat it, you're going to die. And the devil said, oh, if you eat that, you're not going to die. Now, you got to be careful because uh, what were Adam and Eve supposed to believe after they ate the fruit? Who was the liar? Because they ate the fruit, they didn't fall out dead. That's all we think of as physical death. God was telling the truth, but the devil twisted it such that he looked like he was telling the truth and not God. But the damage was done. They died spiritually. And they started trying to avoid God and to run from God, which is our typical reaction. We make a mistake, we run from God. I, I, I know it's our human nature, but having been in church all my life, I don't know why we do that. We're, we're not, we don't, we don't uh, serve an abusive God, we serve a loving God. And whatever we've done, if we can run back to Him, He will love us. And so, uh, but our typical response is to run. Um, God asked Adam, have you eaten of the tree? And everybody starts blaming everybody else. And that's where all the jokes come from, you know. Um, Eve blamed Adam, and Adam bl blamed the, the serpent. He didn't have a leg to stand on, and you know, that whole deal. Of course, I think technically he did have legs to stand on at that point. If you look at the, the curse, you know, because one of the curses that he's going to crawl on the belly uh, from then on. But it, it became the blame games. People still do that. Uh, that's why as a church, as a culture, we want to take responsibility for things. I mean, you could run from stuff forever and it doesn't fix anything. If you make a horrible mistake and you admit it, you can learn from it. Love the story, I forget which corporation it was, but there was a, a young executive that made a million dollar mistake. Literally, he cost the corporation a million dollars. So he walked into the CEO with his resignation letter in hand and he said, the CEO said, what are you doing? He said, well, this is my resignation letter. I made, cost the company a million dollars. I made a mistake. He said, are you kidding me? We just spent a million dollars to train you and you think you're going to leave? It, bottom line, you, we all make mistakes. If we own up to them, we can learn from them. Um, we can fall forward and be who God wants us to be. But listen to God's response when Adam and Eve started running from him. Uh, verse number 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Now if you look in Scripture, God told Adam not to eat of that tree. He didn't tell Eve. So Eve got it second-handed. Adam was told by God, don't do this. But Eve had eaten of the fruit. It's the age-old issue. It's not really a joke. I mean, Adam was down to, do I choose the woman or choose God? And men have been chosen women ever since, you know? And he said, I, I would rather go with her and be with her 
than to go away. And so God was angry at him, though, because he listened and he allowed his family, his wife in particular, to talk him out of something that he'd gotten directly. Eve didn't know what Adam knew, but she had experienced, she hadn't experienced what he had. So the bottom line, Adam still could live in the planet, on this planet, but notice God had removed his direct care from them and placed it in their hands. So watch this, Adam, this is still your place, but you have introduced a major obstacle into this world. You have sublet it to the devil. I gave it to you, and you get, that's why the scripture calls the devil the God of this world. Adam and Eve allowed that to happen. So Romans 5 verse 18 says, therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Because Adam was the father of all, we are bound to his subletting. This world was not Adam's to give, but his sin allowed Satan a piece of his authority. He subleased. If we really want to get into sin and the great impact of it, in my mind, it is not so much the seeds we sow that we have to harvest, it is that we give place to the devil in our lives. And so Adam and Eve gave place to the devil. Ephesians 2 says, and ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The reason our world is in the mess it is is because so many people live lives that are um, led by the spirit of Satan, that they are. I mean, God, God is not contractually obligated for the day-to-day -day care of mankind. God turned the gardening over to Adam. Now man has turned it over to the, to the devil. This is to me very important to understand. Man, um, men, men and women have been freely given the exercise to choose their own free will. I, I love the age-old argument. People say if there's such a good God, then why does bad things happen to good people? We're going to talk about that a little bit. First of all, part of why bad things happen to good people is the only other alternative is for all of us to be robots. Because we don't like it when somebody hurts us, but if we're honest, I guarantee you sometime in your life you have intentionally hurt somebody. Maybe even the person you're sitting next to. You just got mad, you, you, and you, but you, you wouldn't want wanted God to not allow you to do that. And so God doesn't make us robots, we have a free will, and so in this world there are people who are led by demonic spirits and influenced by demonic spirits. Ecclesiastes says that time and chance happeneth to us all. Now there's something crazy about Jesus, I think, in, and that is anytime Jesus was asked questions like that, like he was like, uh, you know, what, what about those uh, that were killed and they mixed the blood and their sacrifices? And he just, he just goes on down the newspaper. He just picks it up and says, well, what about the folks that the Tower of Siloam fell on? He, he started looking at other tragic things. He never gave them an answer under the, other than, I tell you, unless you repent, you're all going to likewise perish. He said the real issue is not how you face your demise, it is that you are ready to face your demise when it comes. Because barring the rapture of the church, it's going to come at some time. And so this explains why bad things happen to good people. The rain falls on the just and the, good, and the unjust. Now, now that is good and bad. We could talk about rain, like the blessings, we, we need rain. Um, uh, sometimes it's tornadoes. It falls to the just and the unjust. Demon-possessed, demon-led individuals are acting out evil upon our world. We live in a cesspool of evil. Bad things happen to good people, but God is not, um, God is not absent in our lives. We have a way to involve Him. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. And now we know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 
and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. The church, a praying individual, is a fly in Satan's ointment. This scripture is saying when the, when the church is out of the way, the devil can just do whatever he wants to do. When bad things happen to good people, the question is, where is God? Right for the day-to-day -day care of this world. But if we will invite him by prayer, he will get involved in the situation. There are some things that God has prophetic stakes driven in the ground that are going to happen whether we pray about them or not. God is, God's not obligated to solve every issue and fix every problem with humanity. Some people struggle with that. I'm going to tell you, he said, you have not because you ask not. He said, I know what you need, but I'm not going to do it until you ask. It's all through Scripture. Um, our, our mess as a human race is mostly self-inflicted. He is not the creator of our confusion. As a basic rule, do, God doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of mankind unless he is invited. This totally changes your prayer life when you understand if this is a mess, I've got to invite God into the situation. When I say this became a part of the vocabulary of the church in New York, it was very common. Folks would come tell me a bad situation, but pastor, I've invited God into the situation. That, that's what prayer does. It invites God. I, I'm inviting God into the, when we pray, we're asking God to come into this city. We're asking God to come into our family. We're asking God to come into this world. Man has been given the right of self-rule. He can make his own choices. And again, there are certain prophetic stakes that are in the ground that are going to happen for sure. Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the, the, the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his, and he changeth the times of the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He has certain things he's going to do, but only to the degree that it accomplishes his overall will. The day-to-day -day operation of what is going to happen in this earth is in our hands. Let me give you some examples of how God has intervened. Some fun history if you're into history. The reason a ragtag group of men beat the British in the Revolutionary War is because God needed the United States to fulfill end-time prophecy and to protect Israel. You do the, the um, research on the Revolutionary War, it, it's absolutely incredible. Theoretically, it's almost like a David and Goliath story. When you look at David and Goliath, there's no way David should have beaten Goliath. But when you look at the research, and actually uh, some Israel defense ministers back all this up. There's a great book by Malcolm Gladwell that talks about David and Goliath. The, the facts are exactly the opposite, because Goliath, as big as he was, could only sling that spear so far. The advantage was David. He could throw that stone a long way and hit him. He had the advantage. It was the same way in the Revolutionary War. The, the British had a way of doing battle, and literally George Washington led us in the first example of almost guerrilla warfare. I mean, we, we just pick on them. They, they had no idea where it was coming from, but we still had God's help. If you go through the Revolutionary War period, it is amazing that there was one, I'm getting, I could stay here all day. I'm getting side, getting excited and sidetracked. There was one example on Long Island where the, the British had all of our forces on Long Island and there was no way to escape. Yet God basically brought a nor'easter in so they were able to come across the water and slip up through Westchester County and then the weather cleared. I mean, there are so many times. Why? Because he needed a United States of America for a prophetic purpose. The British found George Washington praying in the woods. I mean, George Washington should have never lived to be a certain age. They, they found him shot in one battle, holes in his clothes, but no blood. Same thing when the South lost the Civil War. I mean, I know as Southerners, we, we say the South's going to rise again and we kind of have a chip on our shoulder, but I think God was against us because he needed a united states, not a divided states for the purpose of, of, his, of, of his kingdom. The theology of prayer is that prayer is what invites God into the day-to-day -day affairs of mankind. If, if I lease a car to Brother Carter and it breaks down, um, because he didn't maintain it right. Man, shame on you, you know. I am not contractually obligated to solve your problem, but because of our relationship, I might. 
okay? It's the same way. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we, he, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are sons and daughters of God. It even goes a little better than that. We're the bride of Christ. So you mix all that together. If anybody can get me to do something I don't want to, I am so thankful. I mean, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. Um, Coco and I love to do 5Ks four times a year, and it was my intention just to keep moving. If you keep moving, you keep moving. Now I'm doing more than that. I've already done a 5K walking, not a public walking. And so we, three years ago, went to the first race for reconciliation. We didn't know it was the first race for reconciliation, but it was. It's a great race, downtown Martin Luther King Day. It's phenomenal, and he's a traditionalist like me, but in this, I'm 56, and so I'm a little smarter to know, like, you know, we can bail on it this year, but that boy would have wanted to be there. I, we were going to do it. I am so thankful they decided to move that race to Labor Day. Oh, hallelujah. I wouldn't have done that for you. I'd have said, no, ain't no way. It's snow. It's cold. But that little boy of mine that said, well, Dad, we, this is the third one. I mean, you know, I'm probably going to be in a wheelchair someday, and he's going to be pushing me, you know, the 50th, whatever it is. Um, we'll do stuff for our kids that we don't, won't do for anybody else. We'll do things for our spouses that we won't do for anybody else. And yet the Scripture says... That's the relationship we have with God. We can go with Him. I, I wish we could totally devoid ourselves. I am so grateful we have great respect for men of God. Oh, but if Lee Stonekey could pray for this. You know, Chester Wright could pray about this. If Scott Shelton could pray about it. And I think God looks down and says, hey, they're just my kids just like you are. If you just open your mouth, I love you just as much. They're part of the bride just like you are, and I will hear and answer your prayers. God is concerned about his people in this earth, but we need to pray. God is concerned about things that we don't even consider. Ye yesterday was so good. The, the speaker was talking about he didn't pray about where to go to breakfast. I, I don't pray about those things either. And I don't think you should have your life um, totally, you know, well, hold on just a moment. Let me see where we should go, go eat. You know, I think some things God really doesn't care. You know, it's kind of like if my, you know, when my kids were younger, if they were outside playing in the backyard and they came, they kept checking in every 15 minutes. Well, how, what do you want to do? You know, what, what, and finally, I would probably say in exasperation, I don't care. Just go have fun. Uh, but I do think it's good to pray because when we go to God in prayer, uh, God can give us directions. He can give us promptings. There are things, um, one of, I think it was the last session yesterday, um, I, I didn't add this to it, but, um, you know, we often talk about having a prayer list. Uh, I encourage you to have a prayer list. I don't do a prayer list that often, usually about once a year. I'm going to do it it kind of nudged me, I need to do it again. And I will make a prayer list of things that, that I want. Uh, yesterday that came up and I was wearing a pair of corduroy pants. I don't know, it's just kind of goofy. I always wanted a pair of corduroy pants. And, but every time I would look at them, they cost more than I wanted to pay. You know how you go to the store. I mean, I guess people pay those kind of prices for, I mean, I look for them on the sale rack. You know what I'm saying? And so they were more than I wanted to pay. And finally, it had been on my prayer list. God, I want a pair of corduroy pants. And I'd forgotten about that. And I found some dirt cheap. I bought them. I love them. Of course, I don't wear them much in Memphis. You know, it's got to be cold like this before I wear corduroys, you know. But, but I have them. Sometimes we forget. We feel like God's not doing anything for us. Anybody there? Typically, if you're like me, it's because he's not doing what I want him to do right now. All right? It, it's my spoiled part. But if I look back at a list I've made, I'm like, oh, well, looky there. He did that. He did that. He did that. He did that. There, there was something um, my wife and I wanted. Um, it was December. Uh, it would have been 22. Um, it's when I went to Sister Davis's funeral. And um, I, I'm ready to get on the plane. And they said, we're looking for volunteers to be bumped uh, for like a flight two hours later. I said, well, what are you giving? And somebody had, you know, if you deal with Delta or whatever, I think it was Delta, if somebody makes them pay a certain amount and they go there, they got to give everybody. And they told me how much it was. I said, I think I'd wait. I think I'd wait two hours for that. And literally I got a check and went home and made the purchase that we were wanting. Here's, here's why I'm bringing this up. We typically, if we're not careful, only pray for big things. God care. I mean, if he knows how many hair you have in your head, he cares about everything. 
if we'll go to it. You've heard me tell before of Sister Dowdy. I think some of you um, know her. She was in the church in West Memphis for a while, and I thought she was just the weirdest person I'd ever met. I loved her, but she was just weird. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd hear her pray at prayer meeting, Lord, I thank you for the thank you for the windows, and I thank you for the insulation, I thank you for the carpet. And I, She's thanking God for all kinds of stuff that I just take for granted, and I thought, well, that's just weird. And then I thought, okay, what would life be without all those things? I guess she should thank God for that. One day, she was retired. She, she didn't know how to fix an air conditioner, and she prayed, and God sent her somebody. And to me, as a teenager, that was weird because my dad always took care of that. But she taught me I should be thankful for everything, and I should pray about everything. There is nothing too small. One of the greatest ways to learn about prayer is to volunteer to teach the Sunday school class of the kindergartners. Initially, if you're not careful, you'll find yourself chuckling at their prayer request. Well, my pet frog has the hiccups today. Will you pray for my pet frog? Whatever it is. But then you start learning that childlike faith brings some response. Whatever it is, um, Karen Harding, that's what she brings to the table for me. She, she prays for things and God gives it to her. Um, whatever it is, and we've, we've talked about this before, here's my issue. There are things I would not ask for the Lazarus to do. I, I just wouldn't ask him. And he wouldn't ask me to do. We, we consider it rude to ask you to. We have, we have a standard that we won't ask certain people. If we can do it ourselves, we'll do it. Yet we bring that into God and we think, you know, I wouldn't ask him, but remember our relationship. There's not much my boys won't ask me to do. And there's not a whole lot my wife won't ask me to do either. Not much I want to ask her to do. That relationship means I can go to God with everything that matters to me. Um, Romans 8, 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he, he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. One of the cool things about reading the scripture in context is every once in a while you'll go like, wait, 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 wait. I didn't know those scriptures were connected. And they are. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. It is connected with God interceding through us. When we speak in other tongues and we allow God to do things in our lives. I love uh, what we were taught last year, how Billy Cole prayed. Confess your sins, get some things in your mind that you really want God to do, and then pray in the Spirit. Let God take care of things. Everything doesn't work for the good of everybody, but it works for the good of them who are called according to his purpose and who love God. He, here's huge, here's huge. I'm preaching on it today. Being called according to his purpose is a huge deal. I know a lot of folks that love God that that, that verse doesn't apply to them. Being called, and, and the, the inference there is not just called, but you're following that call. When we are on mission, the, the big thing that I got last year out of Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, is that faith as a universal concept in the Bible is totally different than what my little apostolic brain thinks. My, my little apostolic brain thinks, well, we need faith for a building, and we need th thanks for, uh, faith for a miracle, and we need faith, and yes, all of that's true. But in Hebrews 11, the faith that was there was the faith that kept us moving according to his purpose. And when you move according to his purpose, when your omissions, the miracles take place. It's not just that faith to get the miracle. Why do we want the miracle? Because the mission is dependent on the miracle coming that way. So back to our original text. Is there any sick among you? Let the elders pray. Because sickness is in the earth as a result of sin, and God can override it. Now, all of us in this room have had situations where God didn't answer those prayers the way we wanted him to. Um, what we know is children of God, if we're living according to his plan for our life, God's going to heal us. He may choose to heal us on the other side, but he's going to heal us. Um, he says, confess your faults to one another. Stay humble. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. It's not about everybody knowing that we're people of prayer. It's that we know. I I'm just convinced that that truth needs to settle more deeply in my spirit. 
you know, the scripture says we walk by faith and not by sight. But if we're not careful, if our sight is not giving us what we're praying for, we stop, we, we, this room full of people who have been in church decades, stop going after him the way we would go after him. I, I want in my mind settled that if he never answers another prayer from me, I know prayer works. It's powerful and effective. If, if it never turns out the way I want it to, I know that prayer works. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a warder of them that diligently seek him. The supernatural is when the natural laws are superseded by God and God intervenes, but he intervenes because men and women invited him into that situation to pray. The disciples came to Jesus when uh, they couldn't cast the devil out in Matthew 17 and said, why couldn't this happen? And he said, well, this kind comes out with prayer and fasting. I, I, think, I think we need to have a realistic understanding of that and the power of what we do. Um, we often think, well, if I can go on a 40-day fast, my goodness, prayer, something would happen. You know, if you were to fast one day a week for 52 weeks, that's 52 days. I know that's not a 40-day fast, but it's the same amount. If you prayed every day, whatever that time is, if you calculated it up, it's, it's a whole lot. So we often think, well, only those people, and I know, I know an evangelist, Thurman Covey, he's supposed to be with us this year, uh, supposed to be with us last year, but snow canceled it. Uh, he, he's a praying man. I mean, he prays all the time. That's what he does. He's, it, it, it's incredible. Well, you, well, I work a job. I can't pray all day. Whatever you give to God, these, time, these kind will come out by prayer and fasting. It's not our talent. It's not our ability. It's by prayer and fasting. Mankind sublet the earth to the devil, and he has certain rights and powers and license to operate, but prayer can make a difference. Whatever is happening in our lives, we can change it if we will invite God into the situation. Why don't you stand with me? Let's lift our voice and talk to God for just a few moments and ask him to allow us to understand that prayer is simply inviting God into the situation. That in everything that we go to prayer with, it's not a burden, it's an opportunity to invite the only one with unlimited resources and unlimited power and unlimited authority to work on our behalf. God, let us understand that in our lives, in our families' lives, and in this church, God, in this, this, this community, God, in this region, in the world, in this country. God, as we pray, we invite God into the situation. You don't, we don't have to have a license with anybody. We don't have to be viewed as a prophet or apostle or evangelist. We can just be a child of God because the basis of a relationship is not that we're an evangelist, but, but we're children of God. We're the bride of Christ. We are a spouse. And upon that relationship, we come to him knowing that he will hear and answer our prayer when we invite him into the situation. Thank you for that. Let this go deep in our spirits. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed. Shake hands with a few people. Let them know how thrilled you are to see them in the house of the Lord. You got a little extra.